Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So as promised in the last class we had to do two proofs. One is a proof for strong duality for convex programming problems. Another uh, is a slightly different thing, it, it relates to uh, linear programming problems. So our main issue was to prove the strong duality for convex programming problem and show that if the Slater condition fails in case of the convex programming problem, then a finite duality gap may arise. So the duality gap which is the difference between the minimum value of the primal and the maximum value of the dual is 0 when Slater condition holds and could be non-zero, could be finitely non-zero if the Slater condition fails. So let us first consider the problem. Let us just go back to inequality constraints. How we you will do it for equality constraints would be homework. So this is my problem C P where for our convenience C is consists of all x in R n which satisfies the following m inequalities and each of these are convex functions and this naturally is a convex function, no differentiability assumption has been assumed at all. And you see now suppose Slater holds that is there exists x sat such that g i x sat is strictly less than 0 for every i. My claim is the following strong duality holds for C p. Now the issue is okay, uh, issue is that Slater condition must hold that is we are assuming that this set C has a non empty interior. Now you might ask me the question what happens if Slater does not hold. Does that mean that my strong duality can fail even for the convex programming case? The answer is yes. We will show by an example that strong duality will fail even if Slater holds and the problem is convex, a very, very simple looking problem. But what can also happen that you might observe that the Slater does not hold but strong duality is still holding. The question is why the Slater is holding but the strong duality results are not holding. In such a case, you really have to note the following that if you find that strong duality holds even if the even when Slater is not holding, then there is something else which is slightly more general than Slater, such there might such conditions are holding on the constraints. So, there could be a constraint qualification for a convex programming problem more general than Slater, and that condition holds that gives rise to the strong duality results. So Slater condition is not the only condition on which convex programming is dependent. If you have uh, listened to the lecture you would have observed Slater, 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 Slater. So Slater is not the only condition on which this is dependent and 
one can actually go beyond this, but keeping in view the level of the course that we are going to speak about, we are not going to uh, get into those things. That is the area of current research which has started from the late from the maybe just from 99 to and 2000. So, it is quite recent research. So, those who does not uh, is not satiated by the answer and wants to have more, especially those who are actually in the field of optimization and PhD students in optimization who are listening to this lecture, they could uh, just go to the internet and search for convex problems, convex programming without Slater condition. There is a huge literature on it. Also, if you look at into this book in which uh, I am also one of the authors optimality conditions in convex optimization, a book which I had already mentioned. So, in this book published by Taylor and Francis written jointly with Professor Anulekha Dhara, uh, this book also contains a lot of material concerning to this fact. So, okay, let us come into our own world where Slater holds which is a good problem and most of the standard op optimization problems Slater holds, standard convex problems Slater holds. So, now let x star solve C p. Since Slater holds there exists a lambda bar element of R m plus such that L x bar lambda is less than L x bar lambda bar is less than L x lambda bar. This is one condition that holds true for every x in R n and lambda element of R n plus. Let me just tell you that I do not tell mention what a Lagrangian is again because you have already by now seen the term for quite a long time to really immediately know in your mind that this is nothing but f x plus lambda 1 bar lambda 1 g x lambda 2 g 2 x lambda 3 g 3 x plus dot 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 dot. Okay. And the second condition which is called the complementary slackness condition tells us this that is both of lambda i's and g i x bar cannot have strict hold with strict inequality at the same time. Now, what do I have? I have the following. I know that L of x bar lambda bar is actually f, a, f of x bar and which is nothing but the value of the problem C p. So, you see how subtle point condition leads to a strong duality once you know that f of x bar is equal to minimum of L x lambda bar x element of R n. This is a standard thing that you know from subtle point conditions. This fact means this. So, this condition on the right hand side this one leads to this condition. Now, what is by definition this is nothing but theta times lambda bar. So, what I have is f of x bar is equal to theta times lambda bar. Now, take any lambda greater than equal to 0 that is lambda element of R n plus, then what would happen is the following. You will immediately know that f of x bar is bigger than equal to theta of lambda 
by weak duality. See, once you know this fact, then you will immediately see this would imply taking into view this fact that theta lambda bar is bigger than or equal to theta lambda for all lambda in R m plus. So, what does that show? It shows lambda bar maximizes theta over R m plus just by the definition of a maximum. Okay. So, and so the value of the dual problem is theta lambda bar. So, f x bar which is value of the primal problem C p is same as theta lambda bar which is the value of the dual problem d p and that is exactly what strong duality means. Now, every convex pro programming problem need not have a point where its minimum value is achieved because if I take say e to the power minus x. So, if I consider the program and if you draw the graph of this function at 0 it is 1 and then exponentially goes down towards 0 very bad looking map drawing. So, this is the functional value e to the power minus x is f x. Okay. So, now it goes down towards 0 very fast, it asymptotically approaches the x axis, but there is no point on the x axis or the real line where e to the power minus x actually becomes 0. So, the minimum value, so the infimum value of e to the power minus x is 0 but a minimizer does not exist. So, this can be a situation. So, if I have such a problem then what is my dual problem? So, for example, in okay, what happens to my dual problem? For example, in this case, if I look at this problem, my dual problem is there is no g i x. So, now x element of R this system of constraints right obviously there is an x where for which x is strictly less than 0 Slater condition actually holds in that sense. So, in this case if I write theta lambda this is unconstrained case. So, can I write a theta lambda my question. So, in this unconstrained case if I try to write something like this and so okay my Lagrangian is this there is no g so there is no lambdas then I cannot define something like a theta lambda because there is no such lambda here. That is why the writing of Lagrangian and the writing of the dual problem only makes sense when you have constraint problem. Okay, you might ask me okay, you have given an example of an unconstrained problem where there is no it is a convex problem and there is no point where it reaches the minimum. Can you give me an example of a constraint problem where such a thing is happening? Okay. I will give you an example. So, 
So, here I have a convex problem which is extended valued and then this convex problem is actually this, the epigraph is this, this is your APF. Now, I consider minimum of f x over x element of 0 1. Then of course, you observe the same thing happens that this function as x becomes larger, the function value rapidly goes towards 0, but it does not never reach 0. There is no point x for which 1 by x becomes 0. It rapidly declines to 0, but there is no x for which it goes to goes there. So, what happens here again is inf of f x over not 0 1 sorry 0 2 maybe for you for your convenience I will make this r plus. but no minimizer exists. So, here is a constraint case. Of course, I could have taken like this and have a whole thing on the closed set, but okay, does not matter. Let me now go back and answer ask this question. If we know that C p has a lower bound, but does not have a minimizer. Then my question is, what happens to the dual problem? Can we say anything about the dual? So, let us now argue step by step. So, let us see what would be the steps of that argument. The argument is as follows. Now, let because this problem has a lower bound the problem has an infimum. So, let alpha okay, this is what you know. Now, once I know this the following is true. this system has no solution. Now, if this system has no solution, then what can we further say? So, before we get into any other things, just again let us reiterate, we assume that Slater condition holds. Now, okay, this has no solution by separation arguments or by Gordon's theorem. Theorem of the alternative, which we have already walked through. So, by Gordon's theorem of the alternative, we have that there exists lambda naught bigger than or equal to 0, lambda 1 bigger than or equal to 0, lambda m 
bigger than or equal to 0 such that lambda naught, lambda 1, lambda m collectively this is not 0 and lambda naught and you reach this expression. So, this is what you get because this above system has not, no solution and each of these functions are convex which is very clear because this comes out from the data of the problem. Now, if okay, this I have to put i equal to 1 to m. Now, let us see what we can do. If I put slater condition, let me see what happens. Now, you see I will assume that lambda naught is 0. Because of slater condition, I am trying to prove that lambda naught is strictly greater than 0, but we will go by the reductio ad absurdum procedure of mathematics or proof by contradiction or so so maybe it's better to write in this way it's much more simpler to understand first let me write what i claim the claim is that lambda naught is strictly greater than 0 because Slater holds. The interesting part of mathematics is that when you give a lecture and when you do a proof of a thing, you possibly do it so step by step and it appears so structured, people would wonder how did one get into one's mind such a structure, how could one figure out that this would be the structure of a proof. But no, let me assert you that all these were done earlier using guess and test and getting ideas from numerical examples. Later on, the things were more formalized and unified and put into a form which can be re readily accessible by m which is readily accessible by many many people and that is why you would see that uh, most mathematics proofs are highly structured unless you know some it is a issue of research proof or proof of a completely new thing being given where there can be lot of hand wavings and uh, you know lot of things which are not very clear. But so when you are talking about standard things in mathematics you will see the proof is very structured very well written because it is not because somebody suddenly came and one day started writing all those, but because it a lot of people's idea have gone into refining the idea in proving the theorem. So, there is a very famous uh, statement by uh, a mathematician called Gian Carlo Rota of MIT who uh, speaks about uh, F Ries. Ries representation theorem is absolutely fundamental to uh, functional analysis and that is uh, by Ries representation theorem we can show that every linear map on Rn is nothing but the inner product the dot product which is very very important thing. So, this when Ries used to write a paper he never wrote it down immediately he wrote a paper published in obscure journal then kept on refining it with the idea new ideas been pushed in and published in some still better journal while he kept on mediating on it and then at a much later stage he would publish a final version of what he wanted. So, this so this, this is the thing that uh, a, a person like F. Ries used to do. So, a refinement of a theorem comes after many many steps. So, what you see is a very refined version you might think that I am just giving step by step, step by step as if by magic I have come to know the rules. No, these are all by guess and test and then it, it has been refined and written in this form. So, now I my claim is lambda naught is strictly bigger than 0. If not, then lambda naught is 0 and this would imply that this expression is now greater than equal to 0, this expression vanishing because you put lambda naught equal to 0. Now, this expression holds for all x because this expression had been true for all x. Now, 
Now, in particular it is true for the x, x hat for which every i at every i g i x hat satisfied in a with a strict inequality. Thus, for x equal to x hat, it would imply that summation i equal to 1 to m this is what we have from the other equation equation just we had in the last page this one. Now, since x hat since Slater holds sorry not x hat since Slater holds we have If I write down this expression, this expression would be this expression would look like this, but now look at this expression forget this one. Now, for each of these, each of these are strictly less than 0 lambda 1 to lambda m all are bigger than equal to 0, but since lambda naught is always assumed has been assumed to be 0 then the whole and we know that the whole vector lambda naught lambda 1 lambda 2 dot dot lambda m is not 0. So, among these lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda m one non-zero quantity is there because of the fact that we have chosen lambda naught equal to 0. So, this would imply that summation means this expression because these are all because there is one element of them positive say lambda 1 is positive. So, this will become a strictly negative quantity. So, finally, this so what you have finally is this expression right, but I also have this expression from the uh, other one. So, putting x equal to x hat because this is true for all x putting x equal to x hat in particular by choosing the particular x, uh, x hat which for which stator is holding I will get this, but actually what I should get is this. So, there is a contradiction So, this implies so thus lambda naught is not equal to 0 and so we have f of x minus alpha plus summation lambda i by lambda naught So, I divide both sides by lambda naught because lambda naught is positive. So, set lambda i bar is equal to lambda i by lambda naught. Okay. So, this implies now f of x plus summation i equal to 1 to m lambda i bar alpha which is the infimum or which is the value of p this is also the value of p the infimum or the minimum value of the problem c p sorry not p c p. Now, what does the, what is this if you look at it very carefully what is this what is this expression it is nothing but l x lambda bar and that is greater than equal to alpha which is the value of c p. Okay. See for the original problem I just know that it has a lower bound it I do not know whether there is a minimizer for which the lower bound is attained or the infimum is attained. So, let me rewrite L x of lambda bar 
is bigger than alpha is equal to val of C p. So, now if I take the infimum over all x in R n of this expression sorry x lambda bar this becomes bigger than alpha equal to value of C p and this is nothing by, but by the very definition theta lambda bar is greater than equal to value of C p, but by weak duality for any lambda element of R m plus theta of lambda bar is bigger than value of C p is bigger than value of theta of lambda. But again by weak duality because now value of C p is actually bigger than theta no. So, this would imply from here that theta lambda bar is greater than equal to theta lambda. So, you have a lambda bar which maximizes theta. So, you know the dual upper bound exists the dual maximizer exists there is a lambda bar for which the dual function is maximized, but you also have here that by weak duality this is holding value of C p is greater than theta time theta of lambda bar. But we have proved that value of C p is obviously less than theta lambda bar. So, combining this I have value of C p is equal to theta lambda bar. So, what is theta lambda bar? It is nothing but value of d p. So, interesting part is that even if the original problem does not have a lower bound say I am making a mistake I track back even if the original problem does not have a minimizer it can have a lower bound it has a lower bound that is what we have assumed, but it does not have a minimizer there is no x for which that infimum value is achieved that alpha value is achieved there is no x such that f x bar is alpha. Then it does not matter if the dual problem is feasible it is all right. Hmm. If the dual problem is feasible which it is because dual problem is always feasible here because lambda is greater than equal to 0 lambda is in our m plus which is all right. So, then the strong duality not only holds under stator condition, but the dual maximum value is achieved that there is a lambda bar for which the dual value is achieved. Now, we are going to give an example what would happen even in the case of convex programming when slater fails. So, what happens when Slater fails? So, let me write down this is what this example is famous in optimization literature as Duffin's duality gap. Here is a problem original problem P or C P is to find the infimum over x 1 x 2 both x 1 x 2 is in R. So, this is in R 2 find this subject to root over x 1 square plus x 2 square is less than x 1. Now, let me figure out what is the feasible set of this problem it is only telling that x 1 square whatever I take for x 1 if I take x 2 to be 0 then my feasibility is guaranteed. So, what will what it would happen it will immediately tell me that whatever x 1 I take I will have x 1 square plus x 2 square is less than x 1 square. So, I will have x 2 square is equal to is less than equal to 0, but x 2 square is 
equal to 0 then because x 2 square is always greater than equal to 0. So, I will get x 2 equal to 0. So, my feasible set consists elements of this form this feasible set is a subset of in fact a proper subset of R 2. So, this is a proper constraint optimization problem and you have to observe that Slater does not hold, Slater condition does not hold. That is if I put 0 here and if I take any x 1 it will become x 1 equal to x 1. So, there will be no Slater condition holding, there is no strict in strict inequalities are never strict at all points this inequality is active. Now, so x 2 is 0, so inf of in C now is nothing but E x 2 is 0 is 1 so, and that is the value of P. So, what about the dual problem? The dual problem is max of theta lambda, lambda element of in this case I have one constant. So, it is in R plus right. So, here m is actually 1. Now, this will be something very simple. Observe that I can write theta lambda as inf of x in R 2. I am constructing the Lagrangian L. this this minus this is less than is less than equal to 0. So, this is my theta lambda. Now, how do I compute that theta lambda? How do I know what is theta lambda? We will show that theta lambda is 0 for whatever lambda we take and so the maximum value would be 0 and there is a duality gap. Slater does not hold. Let us see how do I compute this. The interesting part is that you see what would happen if I fix up the x 2. So, this is x 1 and this is my x 2. If I fix up my x 2 and then I vary my x 1. So, these are the points I will walk through. Then as x 1 becomes larger and larger right. So, as if x 2 is fixed and x 1 I ran them to plus infinity then does not matter even if it goes to. So, what would happen if I ran, the, ran this to plus infinity then the difference between these two keeps on shrinking. So, a then x 1 square because x 2 is fixed because finally, the infinity the larger number will dominate this is going to 0. So, on this line means once x 2 is fixed, x 2 is fixed, then the minimum value over x 1 is nothing but x 2. So, infimum for a fixed x 2 for each x 2, infimum x over r 2. So, once I fix the x 2, I can only move along the line which is passing through x 2 which is parallel to x 1 axis. So, basically infimum over x 1 which is same as infimum over x 1, infimum over x element of r 2 is same as infimum over x 1, x 2 plus lambda root x 1 square plus x 2 square minus x 1 this thing is nothing but e to the power x 2. So, I know the minimum value of the function over this line when x 2 is held fixed, but if I change the x 2 again I will know in the same way the minimum value which will be E x 2 of that of that particular value of x 2. So, on each of the lines the function value the minimum value of the function when minimized over x 1 is just e to the power x 2. Now, if I vary the x 2 then I am varying the function over the whole plane and thus I get the minimum over the whole plane and 
and e to the power x2 you know goes to 0 the minimum is 0. So, theta of lambda is actually 0 for any lambda you choose any lambda greater than e equal to 0 you choose this implies that value of d p is this is a 0 function. So, value of c p minus value of d p is 1 and which is a positive duality gap. So, even for a convex problem in the case of non satisfaction of Slater condition duality gap may arise. So, there is the if the when the general conditions that might satisfy that which which is a or something of at the level of research which we we had just spoken of that might not even hold for this particular case in fact, does not hold for this particular case. So, with this interesting example I stop here today and from the next class onwards we start a fascinating journey in, into what I call the pleasures of linear programming and after I finish this pleasures of linear programming my next set of lectures would be I would like to call it the joy of semi definite programming. You see how much fun we will have here so much things can be said a lot of difficult problems can be played along with this with semi definite programming. So, this will be your theme for quite some time now after this. So, we you already have a quite a wide idea about the theory of convex programming and now we are going into very particular type of convex program and these are the two most important classes of convex programs. So, with this I end today's lecture thank you very much and hope to see you tomorrow.